reason why you feel like you need to take your notes via laptop for this class. That's fine. I would like you to sit in the front row here, okay? And just know that everyone behind you is going to be able to see whatever you're doing on your laptop, okay? So from now on, anybody who feels like they need to use a laptop, unless you have another reason why you can't sit in the front or whatever, you can come back to me. But um, I want you to be using uh, pen and paper to do that. All right? Okay. Um, so uh, the other thing that I want to mention that's like a more upbeat thing uh, is uh, lunch signups. So a number of you uh, reached out to me and said, hey, I really want to uh, have lunch with this speaker. And so some of it you'll see is already filled out. Uh, for the sake of fairness, I'm just going to randomly decide where I'm going to start handing this out. Uh, remember, uh, this can count as your extra clear thing you do if you write it up. Um, and so uh, up to three people can be signed up for any speaker to have lunch with us. Um, if all three spots are filled, don't write your name in. <laughs> uh, there's two spots that are still available for today. Uh, so if uh, this is something you want to do, um, hopefully you'll sign up. But everything except for the very last one, the 29th of April, still has spots available. Okay? And um, you can do lots of things for your extra free assignment. This is not required and not expected. Um, but this is one entry point into doing that. And you know, it's a free meal. It's not really free because this whole thing is paid for through student fees. So yeah. But uh, other people are paying for your meal in this class, basically. Um, all right, so just randomly, for no reason, I will start the list up in this corner over here.
was working. Shoot. Um, let me get that going. Sorry, we tested it. It worked. <laughs> Hello? Can y'all hear me? Yeah. yeah? Okay. So let me know, do y'all prefer this? Or do you prefer this? The second one? We need the microphone for the video. Oh, you need the microphone for the video. Okay. I can turn the, down, the sound down a little bit. Then. Yeah, hashtag accessibility. Okay, I'm a little loud, so if it, your ears start to bleed, like, you can leave. <laughs> Hello? Okay, I'm just gonna, is, this, is this okay? Yeah? Okay, thank you. So, first of all, thank you, um, Professor Romsberg and Carlsberg, Carly, um, for inviting me to speak. Um, it's a pretty great honor. I work out in the community, and so I'm not really in university environments unless people invite me, so thank you for letting me um, invade. Um, so first of all, I'm gonna um, introduce myself. How is it that I got to this work? Um, what is the work that I do with LGBTQ Connection? And then we're gonna get into the presentation. We only have about 50 minutes, which is pretty much like nothing. But we're gonna make it work, right? Yeah, we're gonna make it work, thank you! Okay, so. Um, so again, my name is Elisa Rivas. Um, my family comes from San Diego, um, my, specifically in Mexico. My family comes from Zacatecas. Anyone here from Zacatecas? So I'm the only special person here. Oh, here we go, okay, YT. Okay, so um, my family got here, uh, we arrived in San Diego, and um, fortunately, I'm lucky enough to have citizenship, because um, my mom was like, I'm gonna make you born here, so that way you have citizenship. And um, when I was about six years old, my dad left my family, and so it was like for, for most of my life, it was like my mom worked six or seven jobs, or six or seven jobs, six or seven hours a week so that she could provide for her three kids and her mom. And like if you're not familiar with like single parent households where your mom is working at, like Jack in the Box or is a maid or like, you know, just like someone who's like pretty working class, um, like you really have to struggle and work together to survive. Um, and so uh, we became a pretty tight knit family, but when um, I started to come out to myself about my sexuality, like being attracted to the boys, um, I, was, uh, I was afraid that like, I would lose all the love my family had for me. And I felt like in order to redeem myself, I had to be a good student. And in order to be liked by my family, I had to show them that I was worth something, even though I had this like big red X over me. And um, lucky enough, I, I got into UCSD and that was the first time that I got to be with a group of people. And the, the group of activists I was with was called Queer and Trans People of Color. Can you, is it, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you, but it keeps, uh, I it would say, let's see if we can get it working on your lapel. OK. Because <laughs> I keep like going like this. Yeah. Yeah, have fun. Is it, is it working? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I'm not in tech. Um, so, um, long story short, I was with a group of people called Queer and Trans People of Color, and they were the ones who like, were finally the ones who taught me, it's like, hey, it's okay to be yourself. It's okay to like, love where you're from, and it's okay to like, have this complex life. Um, and like, what we're about is making um, sure our community is like, making progress and that we can love, hear each, other. We can love each other. Um, and so one of the things that I took away from that is they taught me that like wherever my feet are is where I can make the community I need. Um, and so what that translates to in my work is, um, as a part of what I do is I train um, youth leaders, how to run youth groups, how to be on a youth leadership team, um, and train professionals on how to work with young people um, so that we can build uh, a stronger LGBTQ movement together. Um, and I think that like the part two that I don't really share is um, when I came out of the closet to my mom, um, one of the things that she told me was like, oh, mi hijito, sabes que te quiero mucho y este, perdóname por hacerte como así. Um, and she was like, oh my gosh, my, like my kids, like my, 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 my heart, like I love you so much and I'm like, I'm so sorry for what I did as a mother to make you wrong. Mm. Um, and so, like she, she was like, she thought that like you had to be like molested to be LGBT um, and you had to be like broken to be LGBT or something, there was something my mom did wrong. Um, and so through my job with LGBTQ Connection, I'll share a little bit about it. 
Um, like she and I have like been able to talk about things um, because some like for some of the materials I, I need to translate it, and I'm like, Ma, how do you say that word? And she's like, Oh, like this is how we say it. Um, so we've been able to like rekindle our relationship, um, and it's it's not easy, uh, but it's totally worth it. And so a part of my goal is I think that like the beautiful thing about an academic setting is you get to you get you you all get to have the rigorous opportunity to engage this from an intellectual like perspective to develop your critical thinking skills. Um, and I think that like what I'm trying to offer you today is a little bit different in that like if this is more like emotional critical thinking skills. Um, and like like there's like a lot of traumas and feelings and like things that go on uh, that I don't feel like you can always encapsulate in a research paper. And so today I'm gonna present like more about like the soul and the heart part of things. Does that sound good? Mm -hmm. Okay. And I'm kind of like a drag queen in the sense that like the more you excited you are, the more excited I get, okay? <laughs> so like you have to like really give me energy, okay? Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, and so the, I guess the, is this a, is this a morning show? This is going to be a warning. So I'm very um, like direct and um, some people say aggressive, but I'm like, sure, whatever. So I'm going to be like, hey hat, hey hat and glasses. Yeah, you. Like I haven't heard you talk, like what's your perspective? Are you, you're good, you're Gucci? Yeah. Okay. Cool. So I'm gonna be, I'm gonna be like that. So don't be, don't be scared. It's not personal. Okay. Um, and so with LGBT <coughs> connection, um, fun fact: if you don't know about us, we're in Sonoma County. We're in Santa Rosa and in Sonoma Valley. Have, do, have it, any of y'all ever lived in one of those two places? Yeah, welcome. Okay. Um, and so we started over in Napa. Have y'all heard of Voices? Who, who said yes? Okay. Corner. What Voices? Come on, Vans. Okay, cool. Anybody else? What about that side? Y'all know about voices? Y'all stay in the closet? Okay. Okay. <laughs> so voices um, specifically works with the um, youth and systems of care, so foster youth, youth in probation, youth have been in juvie, youth who are homeless. Um, and so they had a, a young transgender girl who was kicked out of her home from Benicia, and um, she came to the then director of uh, voices and said, like, hey, like, I want an LGBT youth group. Like, there's nothing here, and this is in Napa, by the way. And, um, well, the director at the time said, hey, like, we don't have staff time. We don't have, we can't work extra hours. We're already, like, a, a nonprofit working off, like, a shoestring budget. I don't know what a shoestring budget is, but it's cheap. Um, <laughs> and um, she was like, well, you know what, like, voices, and what this organization is about, like, when a young person, or when a student, or when someone needs something, like, you know, we work together to create it. And so Ian, the then director, said, okay, I got you, and like we're gonna need your leadership. And so from that, it's very much about like if a, if someone who is like a, a, what we call a young person or a youth needs a resource, um, we're here to work with them to provide. It. That's why the like that's why our youth leadership team model is so important. Um, and so since then, we've developed into a um, two county program in four different sites: Napa, Calistoga, Santa Rosa, Sonoma Valley, um, working with um, families, bilingual communities, professionals, etc. Um, picking butt and taking names. Mm -hmm. um, and if you want to know more specifically about what we do, I have my card over here, and I have all this information. You should follow us on Instagram, LGBTQ Sonoma. If you're taking notes, you can take that as a note. LGBTQ Sonoma, um, uh, because we would love um, your like love and support. Okay. So um, a lot of so I'm under the assumption that y'all are here because like you want to learn about gay stuff. <laughs> yeah, like outside of like I guess your house. <laughs> okay, someone on the way back, I can tell you not participatory, so why did you come to this class? Yeah, I'm looking at all you in the corner. <laughs> Orange beanie. Why are you in this class? I took a philosophy class um, about social and political philosophy that opened me to these issues, so I took a class related to that. Beautiful, okay. Okay. Uh, what about you, San Francisco hat? Yeah, that's you. Okay, you enjoyed it. Good. That means that we're, that means that we're doing our job. Okay. Okay. Cool. So it sounds like you're maybe you're an LGBT person. Um, maybe you took a philosophy class and you kind of like were bridged into it. Um, maybe this is your first exposure to LGBTQ issues um, because maybe you haven't had the opportunity before. Um, if you don't know, like I'm LGBT, so don't be too scary. 
Um, and so a part of what we're going to be doing today is um, talking specifically from the perspective of, like, um, I, I want us to think about the perspective not just as we're students here in this classroom, but this is people's life outside of this space. So in this moment, I want you to think about your parent and how open or closed they are to LGBTQ issues. Um, and so I want, you to, I want you to talk with your partner real fast. Um, like, from your parents' perspective or someone in your family, um, and how specifically, like, because we're talking about Latinx stuff, um, what's hard for Latina, Latino, Latinx communities to get what they need in the U.S.? Does that make sense? You can say no. You can be honest. No? Okay. So, uh, from your parents' perspective, or from your own perspective, whatever is easier, like, what's, like, we're assuming that we live in a racist society, right? I don't really think it might be racist. <laughs> Spoiler alert! <laughs> um, so, so here, we'll just start with LGBTQ since we're an LGBTQ class and we'll get to the Latinx search. So, what's hard about talking about LGBTQ topics out of the world with your family? Does that sound good? You're going to talk in pairs right now. Okay, so talk in pairs. So, um, the question was that we're answering is, What's hard for some people about talking about LGBTQ topics? I have four people I have pre-chosen because we don't have that much time, so hurry up. So number one, what did you think? Um, we were discussing that LGBTQ issues are often brought up as like the exception to the rule, and we discussed that there's a reason for circumstances, and that instead of being like a normal person, like you're being accepted as part of the community. Yeah, so like rephrasing it, it's kind of like, this is the bubble of what's normal, and anything out of that is the exception, and without it, you're separate. You're the weirdo. You're the queer one. You're different, right? Okay, number two. Um, I just feel like my parents, they didn't like, have them be like, they didn't have to be like, talking about this is something that just like, didn't happen. So like, it's hard to talk about these things. Whereas like, now that we have queer studies class, it's going to be like, God, they just feel like they need to talk about it. And it's like, <gasps> Gorgeous! So good. So it's kind of like, if our parents never talked about it, and it's taboo, it's like, how are you, how are you gonna talk about something that's taboo? Mm -hmm. Like, the most that we've talked about it is like, oh my gosh, did you know, like, your cousin Janet is like, <laughs> she's a lesbian. You know, it's like, it's very bad, you know? Um, and so it's like, if we don't have having honest open conversations, then we're re, um, like, we're reinforcing that taboo. Number three. Yes, super good. So I, I just want to highlight that like some people have the curse of heterosexuality. <laughs> and, um, no, it's not a curse. We, we, we're curse. But um, like for some people, this is just not part of your life. And like you're probably going to make friends that are similar to you. And so if that's not who you are and that's not in your life, and there's not someone who you love that's a part of that, then it's just not going to be in your life. Um, and so like... I think that's like kind of like one of the things I guess in our way. So the beautiful thing is that you're in this class to learn, right? So thank you for being here. Uh, number four. Um, so William just told us that like there's like a spiritual slash religious component of it, um, where like you know like if your church says this is not okay, this is what your community will follow. Um, and so I just want to have that, that's a very real reality, and that um, some religions can create trauma for people. And so I, I have this ongoing joke that like a lot of reasons why LGBT people are like are love astrology is because like every other church kicked us out, so like now we're just like. Master astrologer. <laughs> um, uh, but yeah, like that's a, that's a huge component. Um, and so despite 
that we have this obstacle of like, <coughs> it's not in our family, it's taboo, my parents didn't talk about it, my religion doesn't want to talk to me about it. Um, I want you to get back in your parish and I want you to talk, why is it still important that we talk about it? So I'm going to use this as the foundation for all the other um, series in this lecture, but this is just like the starting point, okay? So why is it still important that we talk about LGBTQ topics? Mm. This is where you go in your parish. So number one, what do we got? I'm gonna need you to talk louder because I can't hear you. Yeah, so a part of it is like we reinforce the taboo when we're silent about this. And when we break that silence, like we're creating a new norm. And so the more we talk about it, the easier it is for this to be an open conversation. Beautiful. Thank you. Remember, do you want to share something? Well, as a WGS major, um, also to prevent um, discrimination, oppression, suppression, suicide, homicide, and all sorts of suffering. Yeah. So um, just just so folks know, like a lot of people. I mean, I, I mean, I guess it's like obvious for someone like me because like I'm like gay. Uh, but um, but like it's like it's like from our per from the perspective of someone living this life, it's like suicide is very common. Mm -hmm. Silence is very common. Like, being discriminated against is very common. And, like, the less we talk about it, like, the more we reinforce those, those dimensions of what it means to be LGBTQ, even though that didn't exist, like, 500 years ago. Um, but that looks like well, that's a different class. Um, so number two, where are you at? Thank you. So, like, I think, um, so maybe you want to be a social worker, and you're going to have clients who are probably in the LGBT community. Maybe you're going to be a teacher, and you're going to have LGBT students. Maybe you're going to be a parent, and one of your kids is fortunately going to be in the LGBT community. Or maybe, um, like, you may never encounter this, but this is a dimension of someone's story. And so, if we're not open to this, then we're, like, closing off ourselves empathetically to that. And it's kind of like, like, you miss out because, like, I don't know, I feel like you're gonna have LGBT people in your life that you hang out. But thank you. Uh, number three, where you at? Uh, we were talking about how like, for me to talk about more so it's no longer like, the exception that people think of, it's more like the more in society, more common than like, known to more people. Yeah, like for, for this to be something common, like we're, we're fortunate that we live in a day and age where like, like real talk, like if, like if I was living in the 70s, I'd probably be arrested for what I'm wearing, cause like, like I'm not allowed to have these shoes. I shouldn't be wearing girl pants. Like this, like this jewelry is like apparently like, like only for women. Um, and so like I would be arrested. Like I don't, I don't know. I can't do that. Fifty years ago, um, I would, like fifty years ago, dressed the way I am, I would have been arrested. But we're at a point where this is common enough where I can present and I can represent an organization. Thank you. And last one. Yeah, we're here. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so so we kind of talked about like some of the main points around why is it that we're talking about this, um, and one of the ways that I like to like bridge this conversation is there are some things that are pretty what's the word like I guess like obvious to us like you're like oh yeah like duh um, but for other people who aren't a part of the community or who don't represent all aspects of it like it's pretty like not common. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to share some common issues relating specifically to the Latinx community. Um, and I guess the, the context that I'll provide for this is, um, what is what's the official title for this? Like, um, for, your, for your talk or for the series? For the talk. The talk is uh, Schools, Streets, and Souls, How to Be an Activist Anywhere for the LGBTQ Latinx Community. Yeah, so a part of, thank you, like, I wrote that and then I forgot. <laughs> um, so a part of why um, that's, the I mean, I can talk about a lot of things, but a part of why that's my focus is, um, one, like, if it's not obvious, like, like it is. Um, and two is when I got, when I was working half-time in Napa, half-time in Santa Rosa, and one of the first things that I noticed when I was in Santa Rosa is despite it being a pretty LGBT open space, like, relative to, like, I don't know, like, Georgia or something, um, like, it's, it's, 
Um, that, like, even though they have like a pride parade and they have these resources, there was zero resources that I could identify that were Spanish speaking also for LGBTQ people. Like you really had a hunt to find someone who was both bilingual and also served the LGBTQ community. Um, and that felt very frustrating to me. I'm like, what the heck? Like, does like the Latinx community not matter? Like, like where's like the leadership in this? Um, and so I think a part of it is like the leaders, if, if the leaders are not bilingual, then bilingual people are not gonna be met. And so for me, I'm like, you know what, Ian's the director. Ian, like, I, I really wanna change this, like, let's do something different. And so what we did is we did our four hour training, we translated it into Spanish, and we trained 100 providers, and now we have an LGBTQ resource list. Um, and the second thing we did is we're having this thing called the Promotores de Amor, which is um, like working with Spanish-speaking families, specifically in moments of crisis, and creating promotores or promoters um, who are able to advocate for like love and acceptance in the LGBTQ community in Spanish. Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about that in our now. And, um, like yeah, that's kind of like a wrap. Mm -hmm. Is this okay? Mm -hmm. Are y'all paying attention? Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> you can totally, you can totally pretend. When I was in college, I would like try to like stay awake by eating M and M's and then just fall asleep. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. So I'm gonna go over some basic. We call these like youth issues as part of our trainings, um, and then I'm gonna relate them specifically to the Latinx community, right? Okay. So this is like where the lecture part. So at the end of this, I'm gonna ask you to like pinpoint one that stands out to you and then we'll have a conversation about it. Sounds good? Yeah. Yep. Do you need a seat? Are you good? Okay. Okay, so coming out is not a one-time thing. Mm -hmm. What this means is like when someone comes out maybe to you as their best friend, that doesn't mean they're out to their family. That doesn't mean they're out to um, their like religious community. That doesn't mean they're out to their school. That just means they're out to you. And so for LGBT people, coming out is a lifelong process. Um, maybe you're someone who is transgender, and we call it passing, where people can't tell if like, you're trans or not. Um, and like you have to come out as a trans person. Um, or like it's like when, like when you have to, so it's like coming out, of the con coming out of the closet is a constant process. Now, what this means for the Latinx community is people also have to come out as being undocumented. Like being undo having undocumented citizenship, um, which means that like, you don't have like your legal residency papers and you're not able to get stuff like FEMA um, in case there's a fire in your country. Um, and so people also have to constantly come out about that. So that's like a different closet. Um, another closet is um, some people have invisible disabilities. Um, maybe they have uh, the diagnosis of bipolar disorder one. Um, or maybe they have a history of addiction or they have a schizophrenia. And so when they come out about this, they have to constantly come out about this. Um, and so think about like, maybe for yourself or someone you love, like how many closets um, they inhabit and how that works out for them. Or not works out for them, but like, like what, that, what, what that does. Does that make sense? Yep. Okay. If these fall down, um, then take a picture. <laughs> the next one is, um, LGBT people hate their bodies too, um, which is a cute way of saying that. Um, like, I think that when we think, like, I think a lot of the ways that like bulimia and anorexia get portrayed in our media is for some reason it's like this like um, this like it's like well, pretty much only what like young white women suffer from. At least how it's portrayed or uh, in the media. Does that does mm -hmm. that sound about accurate? Mm -hmm. or am I making assumptions? Okay, I'm getting a lot of uh, And so what this means is that in the LGBT community, um, like, people have probably tried pretty, like, desperately and rigorously to be accepted where they're from, and once they enter the LGBTQ community, that doesn't mean that we're not also nasty to each other. Mm -hmm. And so oftentimes for, like, um, for, gay, for, for gay men, like, you have to feel like you really have to, like, fit the mold to be attractive um, and to, like, find someone, and so, like, you go to, like, the ends of the earth to, like, like fit that stereotype. Um, and then with trans, within transgender communities, um, people suffer from, from something called gender dysphoria, I think that's what it's called. Mm -hmm. um, and so what that does is, for some people, um, I worked with a, a young person who, um, he's, a, he's a young trans man, and he um, like runs like seven miles a day, like pretty much like starves himself, is like recovering off heroin, and for him it's like, I don't want to eat more than I want because I don't want my like, hips and I don't want people to like 
visually identifying every one of them. So like I have to start myself um, so that I don't have the adequate picture. Uh, and for trans women, um, a lot of what this means is like I, some people like I think this is like it's less now that with like access to trans health. But in the past, a lot of trans girls I know um, they would like get uh, silicone injections um, and like illegal materials so that their body would be more pervasive. Uh, what this means specifically to the um, to the Latinx community? Do y'all know what Latinx means? No. Okay, I saw some head nods, so that's okay. So instead of saying Latina or Latino. We're going more towards um, Latinx. So instead of A or an O, which are two very gendered things, we use an X. Now, that's very colloquial to the United States context uh -huh. um, in terms of like the activism here. But if you go to other places in Latino America, um, people use an E instead of an X. So that's kind of like a cultural difference. Um, but what it symbolizes is that in both places, people are fed up with the gender binary and they're very different. So, um, and so what this means specifically for Latinx communities is if you're undocumented or if you come from a lower income background, you may not have the insurance to cover things. And so for example, I work with, I'm a facilitator for a group of trans Latinas. They're like the biggest, like, what is it called? Hoopanani? Hula, hop, hula, hula and hopper? I don't know, it's not the English expression. Um, they basically, they're, they're big fun. And um, one of the things they tell me is like, some people they can just like have insurance and then get whatever surgery they need in a few months. But for a lot of trans Latinas who are working out on the field here in Sonoma County with, with the vineyards, they have to like save up hella money um, before they're able to get the, the things they need so they'll go to like the ends of the earth for that. Um, for that. Um, so the next one is um, racism is an LGBTQ issue. Um, I think a lot, like I think for, for I'll speak for myself when I, when I say this, but I think one of the first um, exposures I had to gay people was Will and Grace. And I was like, oh my god, like, <laughs> this is so cool. Um, Y'all know what Will and Grace is? Yeah. Okay, thank god. <laughs> I'm like, I'm not, I'm not that old. Um, and so for, like, I think for a lot of times, like, it's like people like Ellen and um, Will and Grace, and what are other shows like? Modern Family. M Modern Family and Neil Patrick Harris. I think he's gay, right? Yeah. Okay, I don't know. <laughs> uh, and so I think a lot of times, like, people, like, who are, like, on primetime television, <coughs> like, those are the first people you see. Um, and it's, I think representation is beautiful. And it's, it's hard when, like, someone who is not white doesn't see themselves represented. Um, and so the beautiful thing is that nowadays with, like, Netflix, you have people, like, you have a, a diverse media providing new representation. Um, but that doesn't mean that it's not still an issue. Within Sonoma County, I think, like, I'm, oftentimes I'm, like, the only, like, person of color in that space. And that's not because they're like, like, oh, we hate people of color. It's sometimes like that's the people who have enough privilege to do something for the community. Um, because if you're, if you're like trying to like figure out how to like not commit suicide on a daily basis, and like if you're rejected by your family and you can't go there, like, you know, like you do what you can for yourself and then for your community. Mm -hmm. um, and so racism as an LGBTQ issue is, uh, is uh, basically summarized by like, in my three years, I had to do something before there was something like the next for my community. Um, the next one is a family's response to a child's identity affects them for life. And so here we have this handy little sheet. Um, if you want to take it and if you don't, don't. These are expensive. Uh, and, I'm uh, and so here um, there's, like an accept there's like an acceptance side. Like this is what it looks like to accept if you don't really know what you're doing. Um, and this is the impact. And then if you turn it around, this is what rejection looks like. And this is the impact. Um, and I think like if you take like two gay people or if you take two transgender people and you give them one is that has an accepting parent and the other one has a rejecting parent, like it's like a black and white difference. Mm -hmm. um, someone who is rejected by their family is eight times more likely to attempt suicide, six times as likely to report high levels of depression, three times as likely to use illegal drugs, and three times as likely to use HIV or STDs. Or to get HIV or STDs. Um, and so this like, it's kind of like, I guess like for from someone in the community, I'm like, yeah, like that, like whatever. Um, but like for people who don't know about it, it's like it's like pretty staggering statistics. This is based off of the Family Acceptance Project uh, mm -hmm. from SFSU. And so they had like a 14, 14 page little packet, but I'm like, my mom would never read this. She like um, she thinks this is dumb. And so I tried to make a colorful with icon. because um, like I like that. Um, and so it's like if someone is rejected, 
Those are their statistics, but those statistics almost entirely go away once they're accepted. Um, and so what this means is like, well, like at least for uh, Latinx communities, um, is this resource, resources like this weren't really offered in Spanish, and we weren't really having a conversation. And for in, in a community where the nuclear family structure is so important, something that something as severe as an LGBT identity could fracture that could really damage the person. Um, and so, but for example, I was like this like this last Friday I was connecting with a family. And like, th there's like a young trans man where like there's like domestic violence in the family. This young trans man was hurt, and like they felt really ashamed and didn't want to talk to anybody about it. You have like four generations of people in this one household, mm -hmm. and like no one had ever had the like ability or time or knowledge to sit, have a sit down conversation about what does it mean to be trans and what does it mean for this young person to like keep committing suicide and what does it mean like when we talk about pronouns or in Spanish pronombres. Um, and like, what's what can we do to like save each other, knowing that like it's it's a complicated, it's a compl it's complicated because there's also like mental health stuff in there. The next one is, um, schools are generally still not safe for LGBTQ youth. Um, to this dimension, um, like I'm thinking about mostly high schools and, uh, and middle schools. Um, so I can't speak too much to the university system because I feel like. Y'all have classes where people are gay and like, you know, you know what I'm saying? Okay. Um, but at least within high schools, like, um, we did a we I, we did a welcoming school survey over in Napa County and the Napa schools. And when one of the questions is like, can you identify one LGBTQ um, one person that you can safely feel you can talk to about LGBTQ topics? And the most common answer was zero. Mm. Like maybe you trust your coach to teach you how to play soccer. And maybe you trust your you trust your counselor to like get you the classes you need, but if you're not if, if schools aren't explicit about their support for LGBTQ students, then students are not going to feel safe. Um, and what this means for uh, Latinx communities is like like for the Latinx people or for the people of color in this um, in the audience, like tell me if I'm right or wrong. Um, like at least for me and my mom, she was like. You know what, Anissa, like, go figure out whatever you want to do at school, but, like, I'm never going to go to a PTA meeting. My mom was that mom. She was like, PTAs are dumb. Um, like, is that, okay. My mom's also very generous, so I get that from her. <laughs> um, but for, for my mom, it's like she had zero reason to be involved in my school, and she felt like the school, my assumption is that she already felt like the school wasn't for her, and she was already working so much that she wasn't able to participate in after school or, like, parent-teacher conferences. And I'm just case, like, I looked good enough that, like, I got away with doing bad stuff, but, like, never get in trouble for it. Um, that's another one, sure. Um, <laughs> and, um, like, for my mom, like, she never really saw, like, the school as a place that she could be involved with. That was, like, something, I guess, like, what she thought for, like, white moms who, like, made cookies with, like, almond milk. Um, <laughs> um, so the next one is, oh, my God. Um, so LGBT youth face increased substance abuse risk. So from a historical perspective, um, like the only places that LGBTQ people could frequent was like the shady side of the bar. Like there'd be a bar for like regular people and then you'd have to like get a secret access code to like go deeper inside the bar to like hang out with people. And so a lot of the like relationships between LGBTQ people start, were started in the bar system. Like the very first, like have you heard about the Stonewall riots? Yeah? Okay, if you're, you're not even know like, not to sound in your nose, like, <laughs> uh, but the Stonewall riots were like, it was like at a bar scene where gender non-conforming people of color and um, LGBT people were basically at a bar, the police was harassing them and like they started a police strike. And so like the very beginning of the, the very beginning of the like LGBT movement was started one, um, by people of color, two, by gender non-conforming and trans people, and three, at a bar scene. And so, just to come back over here is, like, if the only place you feel like you can really belong is a bar, like, you're just gonna have, like, a lot more exposure to, like, alcohol and substances, et cetera. And maybe, like, I don't want to say that necessarily makes you an alcoholic or, like, an addict or, or, or whatever, um, but something that I found in my research is, if you're an LGBTQ person, like, it's like, imagine, like, you're stressed out by, like, you're stressed out by school, and then you're stressed out because of your relationship, and then you're stressed out because you're not accepted by your family, and then you're stressed out because, 
you don't know how you're gonna like make it in someone's rent. And so you have like all these additional stressors. And so sometimes what those stresses do is that like addictive personalities that are like kind of like in your genetics, like under stress they'll surface. And so for a lot of LGBT people, like addiction and mental illness like surfaces. Does this make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. And so like it's like if if you can if you, like imagine like not only are you worried about like your LGBTQ identity, but you're also figuring out like if you're lacking next person, maybe you're low income, maybe you're undocumented, maybe your family doesn't like respect you, maybe the Catholic Church is saying like we don't want that, um, and so you have like all these additional all these additional stresses. Eliseo, five minutes. Thank you. Um, queer youth and care, who can they trust? Um, so the, this is mostly for youth in the foster care system um, who don't have support. Like, do, raise your hand if you know someone or if you are um, people from the foster care system. Oh, beautiful. Okay, good. Um, so it's like basically you have to talk with your social worker, um, with the house that you're staying in, um, with the judge, and with X amount of people. And if you come out, like, you could inadvertently put yourself at risk for a lot of other things. Um, and so what this means specifically for LGBT people is like if you if you come out, this could potentially be like the of your home. Um, like and for Latinx youth, um, I worked with this um, like it was, he was like 12 years old and he came out of the closet um, and he was living, living in Texas. And then his family kicked him out um, because he was LGBTQ and they had to come into a, like the foster care system over in Sonoma County. Um, and so like for him like. He has a lot of shame around his Latinx identity and also his LGBTQ identity. Uh, the next one is um, when we're saying this is like young people. So, like, imagine people like six, like 14 to 24. So, they're relying on you for sexual health information. And so, I think a lot of the ways that people get sexual health information um, are like through porn and through your friends. And I don't know about you, but those are very reliable resources. <laughs> like, unless they are, in which case, like, party. But, like, they're probably not. Um, and so last one is, um, you have to prove you're a safe LGBTQ space. Um, because just because, just because you say that you're LGBT friendly, doesn't mean that LGBT people are actually gonna feel comfortable with you. This is something you have to prove. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's like being explicit about your support for LGBT celebrities. Maybe it's an LGBT legislation. Maybe it's being okay with using it in front of Maybe it's asking people for their pronouns and then saying yours. Like this is something that you have to constantly prove. You can't just say I like gay people and then expect people gay people to like me. Like that's not how it works. Mm -hmm. okay. So these are kind of like some of like the main issues that people face. Um, so is it okay if I have you go back in pairs and you can just talk about one thing that surprised you? Great. Does that sound good? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Can anyone tell me something that stood out to them? Yeah, what's up? Having, or just knowing that, that uh, LGBTQ people have to come out all the time to every single person to feel that they need to come out. Yeah, that like coming out is not a one time thing and you have to do it constantly. Like, for example, like I went back to Mexico and my family was like, why is your hair long? And I was like, oh, I'm an artist. <laughs> uh, <laughs>
Um, but the beautiful thing is that like I get to represent for people who like don't otherwise have a role model yeah. or who don't know an LGBTQ like the next person. Um, and so maybe you could be that advocate or you could be that representation for some. Um, and so if you're interested, um, we have resources here. Thank you everyone so much. Uh, I really appreciate it.